He was born in Hawaii, so if some of you want to have some uh, warmer daydreams while I continue the rest of his background, go ahead. He has a Bachelor of Science in Psychology, a Master's in Science in Psychology with a minor in Sociology, a PhD in Sociology and a minor in Psychology from Purdue University. He has taught at Indiana University in Fort Wayne and Kokomo and has been with Ball State University from 1958 to the president. present. He is a good friend of the College of Architecture and Planning and has done several publications concerning architecture. Middletown and Good Architecture was published in 1969. Coarseness and Quality in American Building, Social Sources for Architectural Decisions, is described as a lovely book manuscript long in limbo. He has made several regional addresses to the Illinois AIA, Colorado AIA, and the Indiana ISA. He was a principal speaker for the Women in America Architecture Meetings in St. Louis, Missouri. He's made a national address as principal speaker in the American Institute of Architects in Washington, D.C. in 1974. He presented a paper from Where Comes the Good Architecture at Purdue in 1980. He also has been a past Monday night lecture talking about the source of good architecture. He attended the 13th Congression, Congress of the International Union of Architects in Mexico City in 1978. Besides serving on several other university committees, he serves on the Urban Planning Advisory Committee for the university. He has established con and conducted five sessions in a mini seminar series concerning so-called third world urbanization. As I said, he's been a, a long time friend in good standing with this college and he continues to serve on juries every year. Most recently, he was an unchallenged, outspoken and astute judge for the freshman Chick 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 project where he supervised the, the chickens. <laughs> His earlier sabbatical leave was spent in studying new town planning in Western Europe in 1968. The topic of his lecture this evening concerns research done on a sabbatical leave studying low income housing in Southeast Asia in 1981. He traveled to Bombay, Calcutta, Singapore, Indonesia, Bangkok, Hong Kong, Shanghai, Kyoto, and Osaka, as well as Honolulu. And those are mentioned all in a book booklet that is free for those of you who are attending the lecture titled Low Income Housing in Asia. These are available if you did not see them already outside in the lobby. He asked in his own words to keep the introduction short and sweet as that his presentation was to be endless, grinding, and dollars paced. So he closes this with aloha and I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Whitney Gordon. Well, I thank you, Linda. You're most kind. Um, I thank also the weather. In fact, I came prepared that if we were snowed out again, I would crawl through the snow to the peak of Maple Ridge being the highest place around here, about five feet higher than this room, and stand there and raise my hand and say, you don't want to hear about the poor. I know Mr. Regan doesn't want to hear, but I didn't expect it of you. I'm sure it would have made as much difference as my perorations in the shower to Mr. Regan. Well, uh, I need to thank others than the weather and uh, Professor Nelson, the university, financed my sabbatical leave, as we used to call them sabbaticals, and none of this would have happened without that uh, generosity. Likewise, I need to thank and wish to thank the uh, College of Architecture and the Department of Sociology, specifically in regard to this evening, for the materials that Linda showed you. This was very much a generous act. I make a point of this because Money is now, of course, quite uh, tight, frankly, the budgets are tight, and that both departments uh, saw their way clear to have this material Xerox rebound, um, I think speaks very highly of them, and I very much want to express my appreciation to both the College of Architecture and Planning and to my own Department of Sociology. Uh, now, 
this is effectively a slideshow with dual slides. Uh, the slideshow will not suffice for several reasons. First, it involves a good deal of travel, and anytime you show slides when you're traveling, they tend to have a kind of a glib, pitter-patter quality that can be pretty painful. I'll try to reduce the pain, but there's an inherent element of superficiality in a, quote, slideshow when travel is involved. Um, secondly, I want to push hard that you not only pick up a copy, but you read it of the uh, bound materials. First, you'll find a good deal of detailed information, not really detailed, because this is a much shortened version of the formal report that's available in the Bracken Library. Uh, there are technical materials here that would be inappropriate in an evening's lecture. Secondly, there are basic fundamental, sweeping, complex issues that I at least can touch on in a shortened report that in the case of a slideshow are reduced to what I call one-liners. I have in mind the film Reds, which I'm sure many of you have seen. You recall in Reds, you know, most elaborate issue, let's say, uh, on the left would be handled by Emma Goldman on the one hand and John Reed, or Jack Reed, as they said in the film, on the other. And it was done literally in one line each with an interesting backdrop of Petersburg Leningrad. And then we rush on. Well, I will be doing somewhat the same. So complex matters are treated much too briefly in my own remarks. Some of the slides are touristic and frankly so. Uh, my purposes there are in large part to give a break of pace. How many slums, how many apartment blocks is it that you want to view? You know, it can get pretty, pretty tiresome. So to give you a break, also perhaps to amuse and to entertain. But in some cases, there is a more serious purpose also. Some of the civilizations of Asia are very profound, and we know very little about them. And as recently as 10 years ago, we tried to push them around. I do not think that was wise or good or appropriate. I think particularly in the case of Chinese civilization, when you look at the slides on the Forbidden City, you've seen them perhaps before, Professor Saffenfield's, uh, Marvin Rosamond's class, et cetera, et cetera. But you are talking about a high civilization, a civilization larger, deeper, broader than Western civilization. I think we need to remember that. I think we need to keep that very much always in the mind. Now, a note about filming. I had, before going out to Asia, I had never worked with 35 millimeter slides, a point that will become crushingly apparent before the evening is done. What I used uh, after consideration was nothing more than this, a little tiny Olympus XA with a flash attachment that I would put on occasionally. If any of you are going to be filming in difficult circumstances and to film in slums can be very, very tricky, uh, I would recommend this sort of camera. It slips into your pocket and out of your pocket without snagging. It is very flexible. It is discreet. Uh, it works very well. It's uh, a good camera. Uh, now, it uh, did give me trouble on one occasion. I never pretended that I was not filming. I don't want ever to misrepresent. So I always, you know, but I wanted to be as brief and quick and discreet as possible, particularly in what might turn out to be a tense situation. Ironically, the tightest situation happened to be in my own hometown of Honolulu. But all right. Uh, I got in trouble, though, in China with this. The Chinese only in the last year or two have uh, personal photography. You know, people can now afford to have uh, amateur cameras, and they are great camera buffs very enamored of cameras. Had I come in lugging a big Hasselblad or something, I'd have had no trouble. They'd have known I'm a Western tourist with a camera. But because I obviously had a fairly sophisticated camera that was very small, it drew their attention, the very thing I didn't want to do, and I was swamped, whereas other people with Nikons or Pentax or whatever, they were left alone, but I got in trouble with this. Um, for filming, uh, for those of you who are technically oriented, I used Ektachrome 400. Uh, again, I would recommend it. I used a very wide aperture, very fast shutter. Uh, 
I was often on the run, moving quickly, in a traveling, you know, in a moving automobile or something, and again, it was handy to be able to just go bang and get your shot. Now, there are obviously trade-offs. This camera did not have, does not have a telephoto lens, has no filters. The film, 400 film, is awfully fast, particularly in the tropics. It can be just deadly fast. In balance, though, I would recommend, if any of you film in those kinds of circumstances, this sort of solution. If I were to do anything, I think, different, I would use 200 speed rather than 400 speed film, still very fast, but not that fast, and be willing to attach the little light meter more frequently. Well, enough of that. By training, I am a general sociologist who became interested in urban sociology, among other interests, probably because I grew up in an unurban, unurbane Honolulu before World War II. I became fascinated with architecture and probably am a frustrated architect. Uh, for about 14 years, I looked at, quote, social decision making that results in, by some definition, good architecture. I delighted in it. I still delight in it. It is wonderful. So I looked at the cities and I looked at high architecture and high culture. But as we ripen or rot, whatever it is that happens as we get older, we shift a bit. And I, my own consciousness, my own commitments moved in a different direction. And I finally concluded that perhaps as an urban sociologist with an interest in architecture, the most crucial is where it is most needed and most desperate. Well, then you get very practical and you say, where is the, great, the most pressing need? Well, frankly, it's in the great cities of Asia. We're talking about huge, huge cities most of these countries desperately poor, and we're talking about populations that are doubling in a generation, generation after generation. We'll come back to this. So I think that was a logical place to go on my sabbatical. In the field, I had a very elaborate, uh, open-ended series of questions uh, that I would ask uh, colleagues and whoever guided me and this and that. But the um, essence for purposes this evening were three levels of the built environment in the cities. I would always ask my hosts, and this I would do in advance with uh, correspondence, I would like to see your worst conditions, your very worst, your, your hideous. You know, the project or the neighborhood you show when you want to get more money from your government or from the World Bank or somebody. Then show me your best, because you know you don't want to look as if you've come to make fun of them or put them down. Show me your best. Show me your dream project. What you would have if you could have it the way you want it. Well, they're always very happy to do that. And then thirdly, and to me in some points the most important, was to say, show me your project or your neighborhood that is most representative in your mind. That is, that is so typical that nobody even bothers to see it but people live there by the millions and come and go each day by the millions. So that was my basic focus. I will not show you those three levels in each of the cities, or I will keep you here till the snow is six inches deep and the sun is rising, I promise you. Well, I want to suggest now a few ideas or issues and then turn directly to the slides. Some cautions and some preliminary conclusions. Again, I would say, read the printed material. If you don't do that, shame on you. <laughs> All right? It's an assignment that will be on the midterm. Um, first, I would contend, I do contend, that political systems are not necessarily ultimately determinant in terms of what comes out the other end. For instance, highly capitalist Hong Kong, freewheeling Hong Kong, highly competitive, Hong Kong has effectively solved their housing problem. Not entirely, but very close to it, and they will have before long. Shanghai, in China, thoroughly communist, where there is effectively no private sector except now very small activities, has also effectively solved its housing problem. Now look, at a level that would trouble us, both in Hong Kong and China, but those two societies under radically different political systems have effectively done the job. That tells me politics, there is no one political system that assures success. If you look at economic conditions, 
again, I would say, do not make any naive correlations. China is desperately poor, desperately poor. China is doing extraordinarily well, all considered in terms of its housing. Honolulu is extraordinarily wealthy. And by the way, housing conditions in general in Honolulu are very decent. But Honolulu has a project, I'll show it to you in a bit, that is called out there, Pruitt I Go West. It is a disaster. I got in there, my nephew was afraid, he's bigger than I am and 26. Uh, and a surfer, a star surfer, and he was uneasy. The police won't go in there unless they absolutely have to. Of course, heroically, I went in with the ironic thought I'll get killed in my own town at the end of a long trip. <laughs> well, so again, I would say economic conditions for the society in general do not assure you any direct relationship with housing quality. I would note also that Herb Gans noted a number of years ago that good housing need not generate the good society. And Alan Timko years ago remarked, Florence has not always been a happy city. A thought one wants to carry when enjoying the sights of Florence. I would also contend that housing problems in the cities, of the great cities, cannot be resolved until and unless you come to grips with the matter of the rural hinterland. You simply, you will not succeed if you have not somehow worked through the rural hinterland. Secondly, I would, in regard in the, would say in this regard, that you cannot solve the urban housing problem until you have effective family planning. You won't do it, I'm sorry, that is a precondition. And now I recognize there is a precondition to that. If you are going to have effective family planning, population control, you must assure the old people of security in their old age. They must have a safety net, such as we're disassembling. You must. Otherwise, you are not going to succeed. And I, I underscore that, obviously, in my mind's up. What else? I concluded something that's going to trouble some of my sociological colleagues and please some of my anthropologically oriented colleagues. I have a new respect for the role of culture, way of life, as a determinant in urban outcomes. You see, as sociologists, we like to look at social systems, social structures. How do they determine the decisions that are made? Well, I'm very committed to that. But I would also note, and my colleagues would not quarrel with me, I believe, in this regard, behind the system or the structure a society puts together to deal with whatever it's trying to do, is a cultural template, cultural patterns that color and, and form and warp or mold the social structure, the social system which is employed. And obviously this is a circular effect. There are more than one way to skin a cat. There is more than one way to skin a cat and different societies do it in different ways. I'm gonna come back to this for other reasons. Finally, and then let's turn to the slides and enough lecture. Um, I came back very much humbled that most of our generalizations about urban housing, low-income urban housing, fall apart under closer observation. Our generalizations really aren't worth very much. We must look much more closely, with much more refinement, much more discernment, and I would say for my fellow sociologists, and it is our literature I mostly look at, of course, we must think in more dimensions than the sociological dimension. We've been negligent in economics, we've been negligent in political science, we've been negligent in cultural sociology or cultural anthropology, and so forth and so on. Well, enough. Why don't uh, we have some slides and uh, we'll play that game. Oh, I have to make them go. Thank you. Uh, I first, I flew out of uh, Indianapolis to New York, to London, stopped at the London Center, which I recommend to anybody, and then uh, flew down to Bombay by way of the Middle East. On the uh, right, you see the classic uh, photograph uh, of uh, flying. I'll tell you why it's the classic photograph. It's the only one you can take from a modern aeroplane and have anything. On the left is the Gateway to India, 1911, in Bombay. And of course, uh, this was for the royal visit from London. 
and uh, my 747 did not fly under it, unfortunately. I would have delighted to have it. Now, got to make you go. On the right is the population progress. I don't know how legible it is from where you sit. In 1901, we, there were just uh, 900,000 uh, Bombayans. Currently, uh, in 1981, there are 8.3 million. Bombay, there's your growth curve through 21, 40, 1941, 1961, and now 1981. And there we are at 2001 with just over 15 million people. That city is overloaded, totally overloaded now, with 8.3 million. But on the other hand, it looks very nice. This was the hotel at which I stayed. I would recommend it, by the way, if you go to Bombay, the Oberoi, and there is the bay, as lovely as anything you could ever hope to see. It's very, very charming. Can we work on the focus at your end, or should I do it? But very quickly, you begin to realize Bombay is more than that lovely marine drive. There is a little urchin waiting for a tourist. There are three little urchins who are happy to let me take their picture. Uh, oops, we're having trouble on that one side. Well, we'll come back to it anyway. The urchins, uh, they've been very sweet in letting me take their photographs. So I thought I had to do something. Well, I had a vast number of Indian pennies in my pocket. Uh, my wife says I always collect change because I'm so poor with numbers. I give folding money and see what they give me back and then say thank you. So I get these, these you know, these fistfuls of coin. Well, I had a, within a day and a half, I had a fistful of pennies, which are about worth one mil, about one-tenth of a penny. So I pulled them out for the pleasure, you know, to, to give them to the children, who've been very, very generous and very delightful and vivacious. That sweet group of children turned into a school of piranhas and barracudas. They clawed at me, and I mean, they, their faces turned ugly, and they clawed at each other for a tenth of a penny. Don't be mistaken by the tourist's vantage point. Here on the left, I stood out front of the American Express office in Bombay, and that very much gives the flavor of, uh, remind me of Hilo, Hawaii, before World War II, and multiplied by umpteen million. Very bucolic, very sweet, very charming, very poor, and of course, stiflingly hot. Uh, another scene from near the uh, railroad station, the classic tourist type station. Well, we're setting the sun over a dhow, again from my hotel, and it was all very pleasant. In fact, Bombay can be lovely if you're very rich or if you're an American traveling as a tourist and stay at one of the two good hotels. But I had other obligations. And by the way, before turning to that, there is the uh, waterfront at night, again from my hotel. Here on the left, again with focus struggles, uh, is the best building in the city, but what attracted my eye was the wooden filigree, which we may get or may lose. Well, here's some more filigree. 19th century filigree, it's magnificent material for you architects, beautiful detailing. But of course, uh, being battered by mo so-called modernization and by deterioration in the tropics. I'm afraid much of that beautiful wood detailing of the Far East is disappearing very, very rapidly. I then went out and thought, well, I was given a special assigned leave to look at urban housing. I better get away from the hotel and do what I'm doing. So I started out. And here we are starting out and down. That housing is 1960s housing. What you see over there is, uh, might remind you of uh, Oh, the South Bronx or something, Hunter's Point, New York. It is a perfectly adequate part of Bombay. This is not a necessarily poor part of Bombay. Here now you begin to see the real thing. Those are shacks. That, of course, is absolutely stagnant water. And people live the years there, including during the monsoons when you have absolutely torrential rains. Much of it gets washed out in the monsoons, of course. Here are the people. I'll start over here on the left. I was struck in everywhere in India, despite the incredibly difficult climate at times, and it was getting, it was becoming difficult when I was there in the spring, and the unspeakable filth, uh, in, in, unbelievably filthy. People were usually well turned out and well pressed, particularly the women. 
amazingly, somehow they manage in the most impressive way to maintain a kind of a style. They look pressed, you know, you know, ready to go to Sunday school, as we used to say, and under terrible conditions. There again, of course, more shacks, newer housing behind, but the new housing is rapidly deteriorating. Part of that rapid deterioration, by the way, is a function of climate, partly a function of uh, building technology, which is not adequate sometimes, and partly, of course, a matter of workmanship. Well, you, you have inadequate concrete, you have inadequately trained workers, and then you have an absolutely abominable climate that will destroy just about anything, and uh, things run down very, very fast, which is doubly sad in a poor country. Well, I appreciate your efforts. <laughs> she posed for me, and there, of course, is cattle. These are, I would suggest, entirely representative of working class Bombay. Goes on for endless square miles, just endlessly. And this was during relatively good weather. Uh, yeah, there we go. What you're looking at there is a little boy's bottom, and there's another little boy's bottom, and a third one. Well, they're defecating. Uh, they urinate into this trench. They also do their laundry in this trench. I'm, I'm baffled because in India you will find, uh, by our standards, unspeakable public filth, and yet a kind of obsessive and compulsive personal hygiene. It, it seems to me contradictory, but that's my problem, obviously, rather than their problem. Here, this is uh, Babalu's house is uh, not in Bombay, in fact, uh, but it's very representative. And there you begin to see how tight a puka house, a puka construction is solid construction. This is puka construction. This is, you know, this is good. And you see what kind of dimensions we have when we have what would effectively be single beds. Uh, the one room, and then a semi-covered veranda with two more beds. Uh, that, is, uh, that is good housing in, in, in India. Truly, that is good housing. Though, by the way, in Bombay on Marine Drive, you can buy apartments or flats for well over a million dollars. So it's Washington, it's New York, it's San Francisco prices. Here again, endlessly. There, there is no shortage at all. In fact, this is on the road out to the airfield. From Bombay, I took the train, 36-hour train trip, across to Calcutta. We lost our Bombay slide. Well, no problem. Um, I would recommend the train if you go to India, but be sure to go air-conditioned class. Uh, there are eight trains a day. Uh, on the Bombay-Calcutta run. I was on the luxury train, and in the luxury train, there were four uh, carriages that, or bogies as they speak of them, there were four bogies that were uh, first class, and of the four bogies in my train, and it was the only train with air condition on that day, uh, only one bogey or one carriage was air conditioned, that carriage, there were 16. There were 16 uh, berths in that carriage. That's transportation in India. That's, you know, that's the way it is. All right, I took the train across. By the way, uh, for leaving Bombay, this is on a bridge. They've set up house on a bridge. And there's one shack right after another on this little bridge. And they do everything there, including having more Bombayans. Uh, these uh, photographs, unfortunately, were taken through heavily tinted glass from the train uh, cabin. Uh, steam engines, still the norm. A middle-sized town in the middle of uh, India. And I keep thinking of the Wild West. That is a cattle drive of some sort. And uh, somehow I expect to see Gary Cooper come down this way and somebody else come down that way and we'll shoot it out at high noon. Again, the countryside, that's the same village, again, the countryside. One of the things that struck me, strictly from an eyeball uh, sort of uh, demography, and I saw this flying out of India, flying southwest across uh, from Bombay down to Singapore. You look out, and 
Much of the countryside, at least in central India, reminds you of the prairie, perhaps around Colorado, somewhere out there, where you'd expect uh, one inhabitant in umpteen square miles. Uh Uh-uh. Habitation is as dense there as it is in the most fertile parts of the Midwest. And when you get into West Bengal, where it is fertile, urban population is, or population loads are almost unbelievable. I don't know the uh, exact rates, perhaps Professor Beatty, who's here, would know, but I have the feeling that it may be a factor of 10 per square mile or per hectare for equal quality of soil conditions. You would think nobody is out there. I mean, that looks absolutely impossible. That is absolutely barren. And yet every time something moves, you see there are hundreds of people. Somehow they appear out of nowhere. I reached Calcutta, that says Calcutta uh, Metropolitan Development Authority, which is the effort. Should I try to see what we can do here? Can I get you to play with the focus? Or maybe that's maybe that's the best I did. (laughs) Um, This is one of the better parts of Calcutta. Calcutta, with 9.2 million people, is not simply Bombay worse, because Calcutta is probably the most desperate major city in the world. It isn't the housing that is so much worse in Calcutta, though it is worse. It is the infrastructure of the entire urban matrix that is in trouble. I'm talking about water. I'm talking about sewage. I'm talking about transportation. I'm talking about electric power. All of these elements are collapsing within that city. It's nine points. 2 million today, they anticipate by the end of the century about 16 million. This in Delta land, on poor soil, salt laden, the Hooghly River is silting up, they're working on it, but it continues to silt more rapidly than they can correct it. You are talking about absolutely serious business. By the way, while I speak very harshly of conditions in India, I should remind you that one out of five Indians does live in the modern sector. They are modern people living in the modern sector. This is one of the best neighborhoods south of the Maidan. In fact, a gentleman on the train was very pleased to hear that I was, when he found out where I was staying, he said, that is a very nice area, very nice, very lovely, the best part of Calcutta. You will be very happy there. Um, I was happy there. People were marvelous, superb but I was a little troubled at what I was seeing. Here, and I mean no unkindness to an extraordinarily lovely hostess, this is the uh, deck or the lanai or the walkway from my hostess's uh, flat, uh, of which people were very envious. And that's looking down into the alley. By the way, uh, communists, of course, dominate West Bengal. Here, looking up at uh, my quarters, here was the room I had. It was the choice room, 1903. Uh, By the way, uh, the overhead fans, they really do work. They're not only in drugstores in America made today in Hong Kong. They're made in 1903 or something in India. And the four-poster, of course, is not for a wedding canopy, but a mosquito net. But with fan, you're pretty well taken care of. This again the very good part of the city. Uh, There is some slightly better, but this is good. And you must understand that and try to appreciate that. I was fortunate enough to get into a World Bank financed, you'll read about it in the handout, a World Bank financed slum upgrading project. This was an effort, sites and services type program. In this case, it was more than that, it was slum upgrade. This was the community center. They were extremely proud to show it to me. They just thought it was marvelous. I thought it was about as desolate as anything I've seen. And by the way, these are educated and sophisticated people. Do not mock them ever. Here is the walkway into the Buste. Uh, This had been upgraded. This had been apparently at one time much sadder condition. Here is one area you'll read about it in detail. This has been upgraded. The tragedy is that the ground area, in upgrading it, they actually managed to impede drainage. And the woman in the door there, she was sulking at the time, 
was telling my host, who was director of the uh, CMDA, the uh, Calcutta Metropolitan Development Board, she was yelling at him, giving him a very hard time, that the sewage used to drain in the monsoon, but now it doesn't. And they're ankle deep in sewage in their own little courtyard. There are five families in this little courtyard. I went into their uh, abode, and it is described in detail in the materials. I won't pretend to describe it now. It would run much too late. But that is a much improved puka housing area. Very proud of it. Here is more typical of Bombay at dusk through the glass of the automobile on torch. Here is the new town of Salt Lake City in construction, will eventually house about 500,000. This is their show project. It's out at the fringe of the city on land that's been filled. It's a rather long story. And then suddenly you're reminded again that India, of course, is India in all its richness and variety and obviously some of its problems in construction. Huge project. This area here is probably the, my hostess from the University of Calcutta, a sociology professor Ray, suggested this was the area she would wish to live in. This was her dream. In fact, as we walk through this area of Salt Lake City, and that is the name of Salt Lake City, uh, she was almost in a kind of a thrall at the thought that someday she might be able to move in there. This construction is, by the way, 1976 construction. And you can see the problems they are having. By the way, the specifications of these apartments are flats. Uh, that kind of information is in the handout. I'm sparing you that. That, by the way, is 1972 construction. And now, of course, uh, squatters have filled in down below. That, again, is very representative. I had been told that I should definitely go out to the villages, and I did. We went to a village on a Sunday uh, north of, uh, of Calcutta. This is a typical bus. Uh, this is a rural bus, obviously, but not unlike city buses. They were designed to hold 76 passengers, including standees. Average load on the buses of Calcutta is just under 200 people. That in a climate, by the way, that makes Indiana summers look like kid stuff. I mean, if you think August can be bad here, you haven't tried anything. And I wasn't there in the worst part of the year. I was there in late March. And it was still all right, they told me. The countryside, very, very enchanting, very lovely. Again, you, you sense population. In this case, parades get to get underway. But that kind of population load is not uncharacteristic. Uh, old archaeological site and a British effort from the turn of the century, the great banyan tree. We tried to cool off there at one point. We think this might have been a railroad station hotel. We weren't quite sure. I very much wanted to go in and look around and photograph, but it was the one time I thought maybe I better not. It was the one time I chickened out. Still half regret it, but maybe I was able to come back in one piece because I did. <laughs> well, they had a parade because they were having a fair, a uh, great uh, little fair out there. And uh, we had the Scotch uh, marchers, the little girls, with pipes playing Scotch airs in the stinking heat of Calcutta. 20 years, 30 years, 1947, after independence. Here we are, the women's parade, all very, very proud. And the men, they, they tend to parade together to go into the fairgrounds for the community effort. Here are some of the stands being erected very quickly, very efficiently, with very light construction. There again, another bus. Here we are in the village. One of the fair elements, this is the history of humanity according to the education ministry of this village via West Bengal. You start with, uh, by the way, they accept evolution. They're very modern, much more so than Indiana and some other areas. They really believe in evolution. And you march along, I'm sorry I had to take it at a quick angle, but over there you'll see Karl Marx. Uh, you'll see the uh, oppression of the uh, Jews, then we get up to Marx, we go on, we go through all kinds of things, and there is Lenin, and you go on, and there at the very end, the culmination of civilization is life in this village. 
Very sweet. By the way, that little girl dashed home to change into her, quote, Sunday best and photograph. They were very proud. By the way, I'm sorry I didn't have a Polaroid because it is very selfish to take pictures and then go away. What I did was get names and addresses from the grown-ups and sent a print to each child. You know who to do it. The countryside is lush. It's Gauguin-like almost. It's unbe unbelievably beautiful. But, and it looks, it looks open. It doesn't look bad. But you stand there for 10 minutes and suddenly you realize there must be 150 people looking out from under the palm trees at you. It's loaded with people. It's unbelievable. But it is pretty. From there I flew, I took the train actually back to Bombay, then flew down to Singapore to meet my wife who'd flown west across the Pacific. From the airplane, <laughs> Singapore, in the mid-1950s, 85% of the people of Singapore, two and a half million people in this little city-state, lived in slums, dire slums. Today, in, in the spring of 1981, only 2% lived in slums, and they were tearing those slums down rapidly. Singapore is an extraordinary success. Starting in the mid-50s, they came and made two policy decisions under the Lee government, which is very much guided democracy, more guided than democratic. Uh, industrialization and progressively higher technology and housing. And they did it. It is the Switzerland of the Far East. Unfortunately, it is, I found, not very interesting, but very interesting. Here you're looking down from a hotel at the old English 1920s type housing before the English left there, obviously. Newer, very expensive housing. Here again from the airplane window, obviously, looking down at the mass housing. We'll see much more of it up close. A very lovely hotel if you go and can afford it. And after flying across the Pacific, as my wife did, you'll want to put your feet up. Or, or having uh, been in India, you may want to come and put your feet up. I could recommend the Shangri-La Hotel and charge it to American Express and then go hide when you get home. The first housing in the 50s will kind of remind you of our married students' housing of the 60s, which is a, there's a moral there somewhere. And it, this was the sort of thing they were building, and it was sufficed. Very quickly, they moved on. This is housing from the early 1960s. That won't focus too well, I'm afraid. It's my problem. You can see it's becoming larger, uh, square footage is greater, amenities are, are improved, etc. You move up into the 70s. Well, that's still the 60s. Here we're now in the early 70s. We're now getting into serious high-rise construction. Well, does Singapore have lessons for Calcutta and Bombay? It would be my contention that no, she doesn't. That may be unfortunate. Singapore is an extraordinary success. By any standards, it is successful except perhaps by some standards, you'll read about them. I would say no, there are not lessons, because the cultural traditions, let's say, of West Bengal are so radically different from the cultural traditions of the Singaporeans, effectively Chinese. Well, does that say something poor about the Bengalese? No, it doesn't. The Bengalese are proud to be Bengalese. They do not want to be Singaporeans. And when I was shocked, when I left India, it was the one place I left where my heart broke and I want to go back. More than, well, Hong Kong we love dearly, but in terms of human meaning, I would say India came first. So many things are wrong with India, but some things are so enormously right, desperately right. They are not necessarily that way elsewhere. So don't ask the Bengalese to metamorphose into Singaporeans. They pay an extremely high price, and they know it. But they may think it is worth that price. That is not for you and for me to decide. That is for them to decide. We can give them information if they ask for it, but that's all. That's it. Well, enough lecture. A night from our hotel in Singapore. From there, we flew down from Singapore to Jakarta, where a colleague of the Johnsons, who are here this evening, have just returned from the year in Indonesia, met us. In Jakarta, we took the train, 17-hour train, uh, ostensibly air-conditioned, uh, down to Surabaya and then took a uh, 
university van up to Milan. We'll come to that. You are now obviously not in Singapore. Again, you have public filth and personal hygiene of a very high order. It's very representative, little rickshaw type, petty cabs, very, very popular. The standard mode of transportation. Uh, the hall, the hidden language, nonverbal communication, cultural difference. That gentleman we knew from Adam, so to speak, he came over to look at us looking at the maps. Then he went over near to Mrs. Johnson. It was a perfectly normal thing to do. It was not more than six inches from her shoulder with his chin. And I kept thinking, hey, buddy, what are you up to? No, it's different. I'm sure they find us so cold and so distant that uh, we are probably, in their eyes, not much better than frozen Scandinavians or something. In central Sweden. Again, charming. 1924 Dusseldorf manufacture in daily use. These switch engines are in regular use. It's the train buffs heaven. Going on the train down to Milan, could we maybe focus there a little? I think it'll do a little bit better, though maybe not all that much better. All right, Professor Johnson pointed that out to me as we were rattling along the track standing in the uh, hatchway. Uh, two compartments over the water, they would perhaps be politely called defecation boxes. One side for the men, one side for the women, and it drops directly into the muddy water. The trouble is they do some of their laundry in that water. The trouble is they get some of their drinking water from that water. And yet personal hygiene is truly of a very high order. Again, obviously, the formulas of life are different from the formulae that you and I use. You'll see those everywhere in Indonesia. They're very, very popular. A little country fair. Again, look at the trash buildup. I'm not so worried about the visual effect of the trash. I'm worried about the health problems. By the way, about Java in Indonesia, Indonesia is the fifth largest nation in the world, 148 million people. Uh, on Java itself, on the island of Java, it is about half or two-thirds the size of Japan. Japan has a 225 million, highly industrialized. Java has 80 million, not a bit industrialized to speak of, oh, some in Jakarta. Uh, California is at least twice as large and has only 22 million in it. Not only are we talking 80 million people, we're talking a population that will almost it's hard to believe it won't double in the next 28 years. You're talking about 160 million people on a landfall that is now totally overloaded, virtually deforested. Wildlife is now quite scarce. By the way, are you going to ask these people to act and live like Japanese? No, they are not Japanese. Also, they remember how the Japanese behaved during World War II. There you have it. This is, again, not atypical. Those are individual dwelling units. Now, in Milan itself, by the way, again, you can see individual dwelling units. And they're not rare. Again, don't kid yourself. This isn't 1%. This is perhaps 20 30% of the housing or what passes for housing. In Milan, magnificent rice fields as you go up the hill, up towards Milan, it's up country. Here is the, go the government headquarters. It was originally the Dutch colonial empire, uh, headquarters of a town that was probably 20,000 before World War II. It's now a half a million. Think about that. There is the Dutch planter, Wilhelm. Very, very nice. He's in Muncie momentarily. He's in our department. It's Dr. Johnson, of course. And there is Mrs. Johnson with friends. Again, very representative scene. Frank Lloyd Wright is not dead. He lives in Milan, Indonesia. <laughs> How, why, who, I haven't the foggiest. So one of you ought to go down there and check that one out. <laughs> Detail that building and really work it up. 
The brick man. Oh, by the way, that's the Morris Garage body shop. That is a typical body shop. They're working on the panels of that little vehicle. The brick man. Dr. Johnson, on the, between uh, their house and the university, we walked always past the brick man, the brick smasher. Dr. Johnson thought he was some old psychotic until he realized that the man was there every day. By the way, Dr. Johnson took that slide. I did not. He's probably there now because it's about that time of the day there. He's there every day. They bring him a couple of baskets of old used bricks. He sits there and smashes them with his mallet to powder. Then they take away the powder and bring him more bricks. This is in a nice suburb, you know, it's kind of like Westwood over here. And he smashes bricks and in unspeakable heat, day in and day out, the brick smasher. He probably considers himself quite fortunate to have the job. It's different. This is the, uh, by the way, that's the Bogsian hatchery to compete with the one locally. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is the worst slum in Milan. Obviously, we're looking at a much higher standard of living than you are in the poorer sections of Jakarta or Surabaya or much of Indonesia. This is all tiled roof, decent construction, passable drainage. Uh, it's not bad. It's slum, but it's good slum. And by Asian standards, it's extremely good. Malang is a good fate. It's up at 1,700 feet and so forth and so on. Here are the slum of the slum children. Again, delightful people, of course. Rural. This is rural housing. And here you see the classical rattan, but you also see some tile roofing. The countryside, we went picnicking there. Oh, by the way, we had a marvelous visit from the president of the Board of Trustees. There he is. No. Uh, <laughs> that is a 13th century Buddhist item that had sunk uh, rather deeply into the ground through the years. And even during the Depression, the Dutch had it raised and employed labor, perhaps under rather uh, dra draconian circumstances, but they did. Waterfalls in the mountain. I think it was the only time we were cool, you know, all of that. From um, Milan, took the train back to Jakarta, flew to Singapore. I flew on to Bangkok. Bangkok is totally different again. It's Southeast Asia, but now instead of an effectively Muslim society, as you have in uh, Indonesia, it's Buddhist. Very, very Buddhist. A very gentle people, except when they are uh, picking on Vietnamese and a few other things, but traditionally a very gentle people, very sweet. Uh, I should say this about uh, Thai society. It is economically freewheeling. I mean, it is wide open. It's what perhaps Havana used to be almost. Uh, but that freewheeling, free enterprise economy is built upon a social structure and a social system and a political order radically different from anything you and I know. And again, you want to look into it. Professor Tamney, I know, is involved in this sort of thing. Uh, so you have this overlay of modern, rapacious private sector economy on a unique, for our standards, social system. Corruption, wide open. I had been very worried that I wouldn't be able to get into the slums in uh, Bangkok. I had no trouble going into the slums. I could go anywhere alone, had no danger. Where I had problems to keep my taxi drivers from taking me to their favorite kickback massage park, <laughs> where the girls are very nice and very clean and very cheap, and you just have to go there. And I thought, no, I don't. Maybe in, when I when I'm a croaker and dying, I will regret my efforts at virtue. But uh, but that was the problem. No. It's a sprawling city of five and a half million, increasing at a population rate of about five percent per annum. What no slide will show you, you'd need a movie for that, is the stagnancy of the air, the heat, the humidity, the stench, and the endless sprawl, mile after mile in every direction, as in Bombay, as in Calcutta, as in Jakarta. Just endless poverty, a kind of suffocating quality, and a stench that I found very, very demanding. One of the clongs by the royal palace, the canals, uh, again, beautiful wood detailing that's getting swallowed up in modernization with uh, modern uh, construction techniques. Uh, now, we have a problem. Let me try that one. Yeah, all right. Old style shop house, new style shop house. 
Shop houses are a very strong tradition in the East and a very efficient system. You want to read about it. By the way, I only recently read in Shorsky's new book that Vienna, the upper middle class of Vienna at the turn of the century, had shop houses. It was very fashionable. Well, the shop house tradition makes a lot, there's a lot of rationality. Those of you in architecture and planning, you want to think seriously about shop houses, unless Marshes eats everything up or something. Safeway. Tong Tui, desperately poor area with a very interesting political history. Again, it's unfair, a slide. We sit warm or cool and comfortable. It looks enormously evocative, the weathered wood reflected off the still water. Incredibly hot, steamy, stinky, and desperately poor, in fact. Again, slides are unfair. They romanticize anything. Again, though, this very high level of personal hygiene. Little dog wasn't so sure about me, and I wasn't sure about him, so I didn't go further there. Here is the new Klong Tui. Again, can we do? Thank you. The new Klong Tui. This is new, desirable housing. It is much better than what they have in the wooden shacks over the canals. But to me, it looks like a minimum security prison. I found it utterly bleak, but that's, again, perhaps my problem. I would like to think they could do better than this. They have tried. You'll see it in a moment. Ah, no, I did not now play tourist. This happens to be Wat Pai Tung. You'll read about it. This is the entrance to the area. This just happens to be a neighborhood temple, Wat, or temple. There's 381 of them in the city. Magnificent things. They're, no slide does them justice. And they're just here and there. This wasn't one tourist see. I saw it because I wanted to see the slum behind it. This is not a tourist attraction. I wish we could borrow it and have it in Muncie for a while, you know? Just, you know, just a neighborhood beginning. Huh? Uh, well, this looks as bad as anything else. You see the trash in the canal. You see their staggeringly stinking mess. Again, a little shrine, though. The shrine's everywhere in Buddhist society. But notice, that is concrete. That has been recently done. That is slum upgrading. Very, very proud of it. Little store, the little woman, she has TV. 96% of the households in Bangkok have television, including those you saw in Kong Tui. It's a rather high standard of living in that sense. Here is Dang Ding, their show project. They are very proud of it. It reminds me of uh, Russian-style mass housing of the mid-60s. Uh, in fact, this turned out to be more expensive than the society can afford. Their newer projects are not quite as grand as this. Were it not for the trees, I could swear it's what I've seen in pictures of Moscow. Closer in, this was 10 a.m. in the morning. i make that a point. Down Pilotas, the Corbusier lives in Bangkok. And here is the garbage chute. I just missed photographing by no more than 10 seconds what I would consider at least an eight-pound rat that charged up that chute when he saw me. He just shot up the chute. I didn't chase him. <laughs> These are the corridors at 10 o'clock in the morning. Professor Carley is here, and he has taught courses in penology. This is lovely housing. Notice I was secure in the slums, and anyone is secure there because, of course, personal contact. But here, they started with the jealousy glass, which is rather filthy. Then they had to put the iron bars. Those were added later. And, of course, metal doors. You'll read a rather good description of that. I'm running over time, so. Well, I then decided enough of that. I'm going to play tourist. Uh, by the way, this is a commercial slide. There are about a dozen commercial slides this evening. You'll see them right away. They're very different quality. Uh, some better, some not, but they're different. I think I'll just let you enjoy the watts of Bangkok. lights I was able to photograph. I think I'd have nightmares as a kid if I went to that temple. <laughs> These are commercial shots, as you can see. University students are rebuilding the, um, oh, I don't want to say cloisonne, it's uh, 
Oh, diddly dink. Glass. Oh. Little bits of glass in my... Mosaic. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Mosaic. They are voluntarily, the students are, with a little dental trowels, pieces of glass that could not be more than about a quarter inch uh, square, redoing the temples. From Bangkok, I flew on and met my wife who'd flown over, overflown Bangkok to Hong Kong. The harbor of Hong Kong, that's a British man of war. You remember, it's still under British control. Uh, the harbor area of Hong Kong, this is from Kowloon side over to Hong Kong, I think is one of the most beautiful forms in terms of overall landscape. It beats the bend in the White River any day. In fact, I think it is, in many ways, Hong Kong seemed to me everything that San Francisco wishes it were, would be, and the rest of the country wishes we were San Francisco. Uh, most, uh, the most marvelous natural environment with the channel there between Kowloon and Hong Kong. There from Victoria Peak, looking down, there to the west, there to the east, to Hong Kong, then over across, effectively, to Kowloon. Daily use, that is not tourist. That is standard daily use. That, if you stay at the Peninsula Hotel. I would like to assure the dean and the provost the Gordons did not stay at the Peninsula Hotel. We had brunch there, met a very unhappy tourist. Kowloon, absolutely delightful. You can even get a massage there, somebody pointed out somewhere. Yeah, there we are. Ivory. Incredible workmanship. The aesthetic qualities escaped me. The Hong Kong Club, one of the finest buildings in the world, I think, certainly one of the finest in Hong Kong, one of the few open spaces, was just torn down. This is a rapacious society in terms of land use. If you think New York City's bad, try Hong Kong. This is the Supreme Court building, a superb building in superb condition photographed from our hotel, uh, that may be saved. They want to build high-rise office and apartment buildings. That is gone and dead since March. It's gone by January of this year. That's the underside of Hong Kong. This, the Anglican Church of Hong Kong, the magnificent church, unfortunately, with the camera, I was unable to get the blue of the coffered ceiling. 1848, as I recall, is the date on that, or 18, maybe it was 1868. The real church, though, in Hong Kong is commerce, shopping centers that would make Water Tower Place look like kid stuff. There are at least five of them in a city of six and a half million, of course, number of tourists. So we went to church. There at dusk, looking over from Kowloon to Hong Kong, and the Conant Building, those of you in architecture, you want to study the Conant Building. It's one of the best buildings in the world, one of the best sightings. I think it's an absolutely superb building, and I just hope they don't mask it with 20 other buildings before they do its government building. Here is a, actually it's 19th century, but 12th century pattern village in Hong Kong. This is a classic village of Hong Kong, of, of China, southern Chinese village, 12th century pattern, the more recently built. My wife and our host, an Irishman, 250 people in this little compound. And here are the squatters. That housing you see there is Mark I housing from the early 50s. The squatters were so bad, so extensive, and the fire so terrible. On Christmas Eve of 1953, there was a fire. Burned everything flat in one squatter area. And in one night, 53,000 people were burned out. That was just one fire. That's the population of Anderson being burned out. They've got enough problems. They don't need to be burned out, though, given Anderson, I don't know. Uh, the government started on mass housing, initially minimal Mark I and Mark II housing. This is Mark II housing. There you see it. Uh, no facilities in the apartments. Each of those units is an apartment. No cross ventilation, effectively. The johns or toilets are there, the laundry facilities, water is there. Cooking, you were to cook on your own little patio, your own little deck or lanai, walkway. 
That was it. They put them up. Several, 600,000 people were housed in this sort of housing. That won't focus. Here you see a Mark I dwelling unit. There you see the pattern. There you see, again, some of the more elaborate Mark I. Five people in a room of 150 square feet. That was good. That was an improvement. And they built them hundreds of thousands of such units. That's where they started. Here's private sector mass housing in Hong Kong, often desperately cramped. 10-story walk-ups are typical. Keep you slim. Here, though, is the new town of Sha Tin. 100,000 people there now will rise to a population of 500,000 to 750,000 within the next six years. I think I have a slide out of, well, we won't worry about it. Various aspects of the site plan. This was an estuary. They pulled down the mountains and brought up the, closed in the estuary, and you see this sort of thing. This is private sector. It's half public, half private sector. This is the more luxurious, obviously. This is luxurious. You can pay $500,000 for a flat or apartment in that kind of unit. Oh, brave new world. This is middle, middle class housing. High school teachers, government, civil servants, and so forth. Below this deck is the shopping arcade you will see in a moment. Well, no, not yet. There's your shopping arcade. Absolutely magnificent. Meat shop, the green grocer. The boat people. Nothing could be more photogenic. But those boats will, many of them, be 15 feet long. The water, of course, is totally polluted. And you're talking about six people, average, family of six in each one of them. Think about it. Do you know now why the government is trying to clear the boat people? There's still about 60, 70,000. They're being cleared very rapidly. There are the slums at the edge. This is uh, emergency housing. I won't go into it now, but it's a special kind of housing that has been built to take some of the boat people till they can get them into regular apartments. Mark II type housing, Mark V type housing. Notice again, it's always getting bigger and better. This is the latest. This is out at Aberdeen, which used to be just a little fishing village. This is to house boat people. They're bringing them off. And there is a terribly lonely American because she and her husband always sat together alone at big tables. Mm -hmm. If you don't have 10 people around a table in China, you're terribly sad. We were very pleased to have a little privacy. <laughs> this is one of the floating restaurants in Hong Kong. Here you see the old, the new one. From there, we entered the People's Republic of China at Canton or Changchow, and right away you see revolutionary fervor at the Canton Railroad Station. I was totally naive. My greatest naivete was to think that uh, the Chinese would still exhibit revolutionary fervor. No, China is very easy paced, so to speak, laid back. Now, they work very hard, they work very steadily, but in a very easy way. Um, it is not a, you have no feel, at least in the spring of 1981, of a pressured totalitarian society. It's totalitarian, of course, but it was not a driven society. I never saw anyone pedal a bicycle as fast as our slowest student pedals it when he or she doesn't want to go to class. <laughs> and you never, they never hurry. It's just they amble. Life is an ambly, but by the minute. South China. Uh, worker Brigade, of course. This is China today, a ferry and a modern truck, hand uh, carts, variety. Propaganda posters, I saw none with a gun, no one really in a uniform, none of Mao Zedong. They mostly had Boy Scout, Girl Scout qualities that I found very tedious, but that's the style. Bicycles, of course, by the millions and millions. In all of China, we saw only two bicycles that weren't black. One was yellow, and one was shocking, kind of a chartreuse? No, shocking pink of some sort. Lavender. 
crowds of Canton, a very typical scene of Canton. We rushed to the trade fair, had a few minutes at the Canton trade fair that was open. They are doing good work. That is good diesel. They're, they're doing good work. Don't, don't think poorly, poorly of it. Here is classical gold. This is ivory. Look closely. And you even get your pollutants. Town of South China. The Seven Crags, if you get to China, go to the Seven Crags. It's, as my wife said, 17th century print of China. My wife decided we should go to the top of that. We did. It was worth it. But at the time, I tell you, I had doubts. <laughs> you see, it was worth it. You think of Japanese, uh, I mean, of Chinese prints and watercolors, and you think they're too extreme. But when you've been in South China, they're not. They're not overstating the reality of them. From there, we flew up to Shanghai. It is their New York city of 13 to 15 million. Typical noontime crowd in Shanghai. It's just very representative. The Bund, the classic Bund or waterfront of Shanghai. Many more steamers than junks, of course. In fact, you have to kind of look for junks. There are two there, and that was about it. The Peace Hotel, the Palace Hotel built by the British in the 20s when they knew they'd stay there forever in the British area. The hotel rules, polite service, smiling face, warm greetings, personal hygiene. This sign was at the entry to the dining room. And I suspect we were to report anyone who failed. Good attitude, whatever that is, tell the dean. Clean clothing, tidy appearance, proper posture, enthusiastic intention, and satisfactory convenience. In other words, is the John Clean. Stalinist wedding cake. 1959, they built a total of 10 projects for the 10th anniversary of the Chinese Revolution, and it was about then they were being thrown out by Mao Zedong, and the Russians were so mad they couldn't look straight. The morning exercises, done leisurely and with pleasure. This was about quarter of seven in the morning at the Bund in Shanghai. In fact, there's the hotel. Two Chinese in pink. <laughs> By the way, things have loosened up in China. Now it's still touch and go, but look at the element of vanity, the pride, even the mother also is well turned out in the public park on the Bund. That would not have, uh, the child might have been well turned out, but the mother would not have been 10 years ago. That would not have been permitted. Chinese opera, more fun than anything we've ever done here. It's half acrobatics, half opera, half I don't know what. It is just marvelous. <coughs> Now one gets serious again about housing. This is the Fan Gua Lane project of 1964. This old man argued that they should keep some of the housing. This was the kind of housing he lived in in World War II. It was typical of that slum. It was one of the worst slums of Shanghai. He had two children there during the occupation by the Japanese, and of course they very nearly starved to death. Yeah, there is snow in winter, and it's 105 degrees in the summer, and very humid. So that was the kind of housing you're looking at at the time of the Chinese Revolution, or liberation, as they call it. Here, again, they preserved some, where they upgraded some of the better housing in the slum in 1950. They had upgraded. This was better housing. They saved, generally, and it was used and lived in in the early 50s. It reminds me of 14th century Europe, as I imagine it. Here is the rebuilding that was done in 1964 in the same area very carefully planned, you'll want to read about it, a very pleasant kind of place. All right, it's a little bit tatty, but uh, think of Scheidler Hall. <laughs> the birds, the old, the retired people are urged to have birds and to walk the birds, and they have bird singing contests Monday morning. What do we do for our old people? Take away their food stamps. Unimproved slum, about a million live still there, improved slum. About a million to two million are improved slums. Improved slum neighborhood. This housing and this, the first mass housing after the revolution in 1949-50, this was built in 1951. China was in chaos, was ruined. 
She was fighting a limited war against us in Korea, and she built this kind of housing this early. Oops. We're, I think I can. Can you help me there? I don't know that that's the coordinate slide on the other side, but let's not worry about it. We'll see what happens next. This is 1953. Notice how quickly they began to upgrade the quality of their mass housing. That's mid-1950s, by the way. Notice they're holding hands. Things had changed in China very dramatically that you'd see that. They were linked arms. This is mid-19, late 1950s housing. You'll read about that uh, there on the left. It is... Uh, uh, blah, blah, blah. Lost the name. Here is 1970s, late 60s, early 70s housing. Uh, we are not quite coordinated. There we go. 1975, their show project. This is the Cha Ch Chu Cha Ha Hu project. Now, I want to say one more thing. To what do we attribute Shanghai and China's success in housing? I do not personally attribute it to Marxism. I think Marxism played a fairly small role in the modernization of China. What I, the conclusion I came to, but obviously uh, tentative in the extreme, is that the success of China has more to do with the revitalization of classical China, the revitalization of a great and very sensitive and delicate and complex tradition, which used the Marxian vocabulary to assist in modernization. Because obviously, capitalistic vocabulary and warlordism vocabulary, as Chiang Kai-shek used, failed. So my, I would attribute this much more to revitalize China than I would to Marxism as such. This is the shopping arcade. But see the contrast now to Hong Kong shopping. This was good shopping in this show project. From there. We flew up to Beijing, or Beijing or Peking, and here we played tourists, frankly. Here you see the tree planting that is everywhere. There is not a road in China that doesn't have trees. Oh, Lordy, I'm watching. I think in terms of the artistic achievements of the Beijing area, the Temple of Heaven, the Forbidden City, I'll leave you in peace with it. I would only say this, only a great civilization generates this sort of architecture and planning. There are four uh, units in this project. And unfortunately, here's modern, great hall of the people, Mao's mausoleum. It is their Washington, their Lincoln Memorial, and people by the thousands every day line up, and we went past. And by the way, Mao's ears are big. <laughs> Looked at it. Street scenes in Beijing. Tail fins are not dead, my friends. The 1950s pattern Volvo, the Chinese added the Russian model manufactured in China, they added the tail fins to update, and they're there. Panda bears, of course, in the famous part. Acrobats. The one thing you can see from the moon, no, it's from space, I should say, is the Wall of China. The Summer Palace, some of these are commercial. Continue to have problems on the left if you can help. Uh, if you can't, uh, don't lose sleep over it, though. The, fa the infamous marble navy the dowager made. Sunday crowd, I dared one of the fellow tourists to speak in a loud voice in Chinese. The peasants ought to get out of here and leave it to the elite. <laughs> Thank you.
all hand painted. By the way, the Summer Palace was ravaged during the Great Cultural Revolution. It's been re refinished, updated, brought back. Unfortunately, the workmanship is not terribly good on some of the reconstructions. The Ming tombs. Wouldn't you love to have that in your front yard? <laughs> you know, that would, that, darn it, that would impress them, you know? It, 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 in that size. <laughs> the Forbidden City. There's a long story how they floated those huge sections of stone, cut stone, 500 kilometers, uh, about 300, 250, 260 miles uh, to Beijing on ice. They made dug wells. It's, it's an incredible story. I won't take time with it. I felt the Forbidden City dwarfs Versailles, makes Versailles look like some kind of arrogant, pompous 18-year-old's idea of self-glory. Forbidden City is much better. I want that outside my office. <laughs> you may approach the throne and meet the emperor on equal grounds, quite evidently. Oop. Can you help me there? The detailing, you know, the imperial, uh, the forbidden city is vast. It's just vast. But then you get up and you look at the detailing, and it's incredibly sweet and fine. Red room and the blue room. These are commercial slides, obviously. Brought down from Siam. Unbelievably fine. But then, for all the glory of the Imperial Palace, as you leave by way of the back, as we did, you suddenly, it suddenly hits you. This, though, is concentrated power with all the leaden weight of it. You know, behind all the beauty, at some point, there is naked power. You see walls like that, and you're looking at naked power. And I found it rather chilling. I felt much more comfortable then when I saw the more intimate environment of a neighborhood as we left. And there we flew to Japan, landed in Tokyo, took the uh, bullet train down to Kiroshiki, really, and then doubled back to Kyoto and Osaka. There, of course, is Fuji from the train. We went to pay our respects to the emperor, having looked at Mao in his tomb three days earlier. We went to see the emperor on his 80th birthday, and I kept looking at that flag because I was bombed on December 7th of 1941. And that I, somehow, I, there was still a pace. I didn't really like that flag. And I thought, oh, that it would still bother me after all these years. I was rather sad with myself. I thought I should be beyond that. Famous, of course, the great lantern. This was right next to our hotel. There's my wife going up to go to church, obviously. And there's coming down the other side of the temple into a, this is in the heart of Tokyo, right squack in the middle of it. For Boys' Day, which was coming up, this neighborhood is literally in downtown Manhattan, if you wish. Tokyo, as most Japanese cities, are really a series of neighborhoods. Completely comfortable, intimate, safe, of course. Personal safety in Tokyo and Japan generally is famous, and for good reason. We took the bullet train. You get 350 miles of this. Japan Incorporated. Urban, industrial, incredibly productive, and jammed along the coastline there. We went to the village of Kurashika. It's an art colony to put our feet up. It's uh, famous among the Japanese. My wife discovered it somehow, and we were about the only Westerners that were there in the three days we were there. We were exhausted from China. We went to a lovely Japanese inn just off this canal. And there my wife negotiating stones. That was the view from our quarters. Doesn't that remind you of the Holiday Inn? That was our own little room. That was our own little garden, just ours. If you go to Japan, blow an extra $50 a night for a couple of nights and go to a good Japanese inn. It is one of the most civilized and perfect environments you could ever hope to encounter. Uh, by the way, though, beauty in Japan is entirely programmed. There is nothing spontaneous behind it. 
it is, it is planned to the last moment, but it is so perfect you forget that it isn't spontaneous. In our quarters, one ate, we drank beer, and uh, then when we uh, stretched our legs after dinner, uh, they made up the bed, so to speak, the mats. And then in the morning, we went out and saw the children in their art class up at the temple up the hill. Very good in detail, not so good at general con conception, though, which didn't surprise me. I was not happy to live Kurishika. It wasn't that I had come out of a committee meeting in Ball State. Now, I wanted to look at Kyoto and Osaka. Kyoto was spared during the war because of its historic and cultural uh, resources and because there wasn't much else there, a city of about two million. Osaka, about 18 miles away, is there Chicago. We bombed it to pieces in the war with our B-29 bombers, smashed it up, and I very much wanted to see Japan rebuild low-income housing and Japan not rebuild low-income housing. Do you know how I know which is Osaka and which is Kyoto? It drizzled the day I walked around Kyoto with my hose. Uh, I mean, Osaka, that's Osaka. Kyoto, it didn't drizzle. You could not, I can know if you look very closely at some of the siding, if you knew what to look for, you could see which had been bombed and which hadn't. But there is no, in Japan, there is no uh, mass housing except one project in Osaka. There, is, there are virtually no slums in Japan today, and there's virtually no government assistance. Now, that's going to make Ronald Reagan very happy. No slums, no mass housing, and no government assistance to speak of. The trouble is, he doesn't want to be Japanese. And that's what he would have to be, and we would have to be. And all due respects to Japanese culture, we are not Japanese, and I don't think we choose to be. We may regret it later for some reasons, but at the moment, no. This is an improved neighborhood, upgraded. This was, a, they were very proud to show me this project. Here you see it again. Where they'd taken uh, some tacky older area, though nothing was really that tacky, and brought it back up. The trouble is, and you want to read about this, a lack of audio privacy. It's terribly, terribly charming to the eye, but it's pretty tough in terms of audio privacy in traditional Japanese housing great inhibitor in almost every direction. Now the temples of Kyoto and the gardens, again, I will leave you in peace and you can just watch. Whoop. Thank you. By the way, that's all moss down under there. It's all moss garden. Moss again. I'm very glad we didn't bomb. This is Nijo Palace. My wife saw it, I did not. By the way, these are transferred from postcards, believe it or not, these two slides. Wouldn't you love to live in that garden? Think of your days when you're just totally harried and fed up, either because we as faculty have done it to you or as faculty we've done it to each other, you know? It's raked gravel, of course. I'm sorry that isn't a better slide. This is new construction, very new. Look at the detailing. Why, why can't we at least approach that? What, where do we fail? Um, something I want to think about. Well, this is obviously not Kyoto. It's Manila. We flew down, well, actually to Hong Kong, and then out to Manila. We were very briefly in Manila, uh, as it turned out, for a number of reasons. Didn't do what I had hoped to do, so just a couple of slides. 
Detroit fell short. They turned back. They left the tail fin and the chrome when they were just beginning. We wouldn't have the problems we had if we stayed with what we did well and imitated the Filipinos. What you need is air horns in Manila. It's noisy now. Wedding reception at the Manila Hotel and a parade we stumbled onto for San Pedro. Was this? No? I think it's San From there we flew back towards Honolulu. This is the view from my brother's Lanai. When we were children, had you stood there, well, there was nothing there. It's in a new suburban neighborhood since the war. Thank you. Here is Pruadaigo West. I called it Kamehameha Gardens. That's a pseudonym, obviously. Uh, the police don't want to go in. My nephew didn't want to go in, though he's 26 and six foot one or two, uh, and a surfer and looks it. Uh, you get shot at. I decided, well, look, there's only one who wants to find out what it's like, and that's to go in. Um, here I'm showing something else. I want to show you how you edit with the camera. Simple, you know, again, untutored. I stood in the same, this is virtually the same spot, looking one way, and you see a terrible bleakness. Turn around 180 degrees, and it's nothing great, but it's not that bad. The trouble is it's a social disaster, a total disaster. On the contrast, though, the other extreme is what I call Kapu Lookout. This is a ostensibly public housing, actually, well, you want to read about it. It's nominally public housing. It's lovely. <laughs> they have their own Japanese garden that you're looking down at from one of the rooms. Notice different clientele, but it is officially public. Here is from my brother's lanai in the evening. Now look, where obviously the sun is setting slowly in the west and you'll hear aloha oi or something being played in the background. I know it is at this point traditional for the audience to applaud the speaker no matter how tedious the presentation may have been. I'd like to reverse that if I might. I would like that uh, if you are with your indulgence that the applause should go to this university for funding this project Secondly, to the College of Architecture and Planning, and thirdly, and in equal measure, to my own department, the Department of Sociology. And I think we all thank them. And I thank you. <laughs>